God is working, he's still working, God is working even now. Hallelujah, he's working even now. God is working. God is working with me. Yeah, folks, good evening. If you can hear me, just indicate on the Facebook page. Let me be sure you can hear me. Just give me a hi, something. Yeah, folks. You can hear me, just God is working. He's still working. I'll be with you very soon. Just give me a few moments once again. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, just indicate you can hear me, folks. You know, technology, sometimes you're not too sure whether you've been heard or not. So please, please, please. If you can hear me. All right. God is working with the mind. All right, for some days, we've been dealing with contending with horses. Contending with horses. And um, today we intend to continue with that discussion on contending with horses. Uh, Friends, just let me know if you can hear me. Just give me, indicate on the Facebook page, because I'm doing Facebook Live. Let me be sure you can hear me. Let me show the sound and everything is fine. So just drop a comment that you can hear me. Then we can continue with contending with horses. We want to raise an army, people who are determined to impact their generation, people who will not allow anything to intimidate them. And still not getting any feedback from you. Doesn't mean you can hear me or you can hear me.
All right, so we can hold on with the music. I just want to believe you can hear me. All right, so good. So we have been looking at how we can contend with any challenge that would come our way as we undertake this journey of life. Some of us, by the grace of God, we found ourselves in various positions. And it's important that we, in those positions that God has given us, we make all the impact that we can make. We leave all the legacy that we can make without leaving this world. May you not die until you have made your impact. May you never miss out on your providential way. And that is my prayer for you. And that is the reason for we contending with horses. That is the essence of we contending with horses. Now we began by saying that Bible says that God created all things by his word. And that is very important we understand that. And he also said that he, um, he, his word is spirit and life. Let me just a minute, let me check on, uh, because it's an engagement, I want to be sure that I can read your comments and uh, respond accordingly. Okay. I want to be sure I can read your comments. So let me get that set up, then we can continue from here. Okay, good, 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 great. Now I can, I can, I can have your feedback. Great, great, great. Hey, uh, decent. Good to have you and uh, Stella. Great. Okay, so I think we can continue. Now I'm saying that we started by saying that the word of God is so clear that He created everything by His word, and His word He has made it clear is spirit and life. So last week, we said that everything God created came out of his word, came out of spirit, and came out of life. And so in every creation, God is connected to his own creation. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear that in the last days, I mean, at the end of the age, everything will begin to say, everything will begin to say. So everything in the sea, everything, um, beneath the earth, on the earth, in the sky, will begin to say. The Bible even talks about mountains clapping their hands, shouting with joy. So we may not understand creation because we are not in that world, but there's every indication that God knows how to communicate with his creation because there is that link age. We don't know the details of that linkage, but just get that understanding that it is not only human beings that God has communication with. It's not only human beings that can praise the Lord, that can connect with God. God has made it very clear that he, everything is in Christ. And at the end of the day, the mountains will clap. In fact, the Bible says that there's going to be peace between animals here and they're both in the millennium. And then um, in heaven, we'll have a new world altogether. But just to establish the point that God has a connection with all his creation. And so we said that if God has a connection with all his creation, then he has created everything so that we can look at it and give glory to God. Nothing is to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. And um, we are saying that only God is to be worshipped. So okay, just a minute. Only God is to be worshipped. So you can, but you can have a kind of relationship in terms of 
learning lessons. And that is the point I want to make. We can have a relationship in terms of learning lessons from God's own creation. And that is why we have chosen one of the creation of God, which are the horses. And that is what we are looking at in terms of the lessons that we are learning. And then we said that horses by nature are very sensitive to sound. And I prayed last week that we would also be so sensitive to sound. Eh? We'll be able to hear and hear very well. Because if, if you cannot really hear, if you cannot hear from God, it will be so difficult for you to um, get to know what God is saying, whether in Christian life, whether in business, whether in marriage, whether in, in communication, whether in, in the things that we do here on earth, without a good hearing from God, we will definitely not be able to achieve what God wants us to hear. And great minds have been able to make it because they can hear. Sometimes, as I said last week, we, we have the penchant to think that it's only during prophecy that God speaks. But sometimes your ability to hear what God is saying, even through a river or through a rock or through some tree, through some writing, on, on a car, would drop an idea, would drop um, a strategy, a plan. Something will happen. You can go through a misfortune or you can go through an event. You may be traveling and as you see the, the car moving and the trees moving, that can be a, a, an idea that God would drop into your spirit so that you can hear God. Let's get it very clear that God speaks and he does not only speak by that says the Lord by through prophetic declarations god also speak by we getting to hear him by the things he has created and until we get that understanding yeah last week there was this trying to get the understanding with the, some of the conversation we, we we had until there's that understanding that god has put in all his creative work something that brings glory something that speaks i would only be hearing waiting to hear god in the chapel You would only be wanting to hear God in the chapel. And that is not what uh, God expects of us alone. <clears throat> so um, I pray that when God speaks during conference meetings and, and then somebody stands up or even watch the, the, the sun and the moon, God will speak through it. And you get business ideas, you get academic ideas, you get research topics. And these are the things that will completely change your life. So it's important we understand that point clearly. And I want to establish it, that God speaks. And like the horse, if we can compete with horses, if we can contend with horses, then we must have better hearing ability, better connection with God. The next thing we, we spoke about is the lessons that we can learn from God and we, uh, from the horses. And we said that horses, um, uh, to be able to contend with horses, we must be able to contend with their smelling ability. The horses are able to smell, they're able to distinguish, they're able to uh, know, even when you have not spoken, they can sense that this is happening. They can sense that this is, uh, my boss coming, my, the predator is coming, an enemy is coming. And so in your business, you must be able to sense those that will help you, those that will be, that have joined the team just to cause problems. If you don't have the ability to sense and to discern, you may pay billions or millions of dollars or cities just to hire people who come and destroy your business, who come and destroy the ideas that you've had. And the mistake we often make is that we do not, we, we, we do not have that ability to smell, to discern, to know who are my best business partners, who are the best people I'll call into ministry? Who are the best, who is the best person I'm going to marry? Who is the best person? Who are my friends? There are times that you need to cut off some friends from your life, cut off some business partners, cut off some people from your life. But if you're not able to discern the times and the seasons, it will be a difficult. And I pray that you will not have this challenge. Um, the other thing that I want you to know, and um, as, I, as I indicated, those of you who have just joined, uh, my live live stream sessions are not really preaching. So uh, I want to hear your mind. I want to hear your views. I want you to share your ideas. I'll just do an introduction, just a few minutes. 
And after that, I will listen to your ideas that you have. Um, uh, somebody's asking for the link, uh, please. All right, folks, as I said, this is not uh, really just preaching. So don't worry, there are uh, connected with people here. I want to connect with you. So after some time, put your questions together. I, I will engage you. Those of you who are on Zoom, uh, you can ask the question. I'll put you on live Facebook, and then we interact and we engage with you. So um, you, you can just come into my Facebook, uh, live Zoom uh, waiting room, and I'll bring you on. You can also, um, as I said, I put the link. Last week, when I put the link on social media, people started uh, hacking in. So this time, you have to come to my Telegram or you must be on my WhatsApp page so that I'll give you the link on my WhatsApp page so that I know that everybody coming is a serious person who's not going to create problems. So if you want the link so that you can ask questions on Zoom or in, engage on Zoom, please um, just check the WhatsApp. Those of you already on my WhatsApp, I've, I've sent a link to you. But you can come on Telegram. I'll post the link there over and over again. And then you can ask your questions or make your contributions. All right. Or you can even inbox me on my WhatsApp, 54 um, And then we can bring you. Because I want to engage you. I'm not just going to preach. As for preaching, I'll do it in the chapel. But now I just to have a relationship. So let's get back to the point of discussion. I was saying that so we need to learn from horses, we need to be able to descend like pray that God will enable you to descend. God will enable you to know what has to be done. But the other lesson, uh, so moving away from last week, I, I don't think I would want to repeat so much if not, we will not make progress. Some of you sent me a message that you were not online last week, you didn't hear. That means I have to keep repeating. And um, so I've, I've tried to give a summary we said that we need to be able to hear and hear well. We need to be able to smell and smell. We need to be able to understand those that we are dealing with and it's going to be helpful for us. Now today, I want to concentrate on an aspect of the horse which is intended for competition. Horses normally are trained for race. Horses are trained to compete. They are trained for battle. So when there is a battle, when there's a race, when, there's, when we are contending, with the, the, the forces of darkness when we are contending with our business partners. And, and note that contending with horses is not only in, the, in, in terms of a fiscal battle where you're going to kill people. No, no, no. We're, we're talking about contending with the challenges of our time. If you are into IT, you have the Bill Gates and other people that you are contending with. If you are into social networking, you have other people you are contending with. If you are into ministry, there are pastors already in the system that you are contending with. If, whatever, if it is business, there are people that you are contending. And that is what I mean by contending. I don't mean fighting, but I mean competition. I mean to be able to face the challenges of the times and be able to overcome them. That is exactly what I'm talking about. I pray that um, so many things will come at you in life, but you must be able to contend with it, with it. Now, so in terms of competition, every competition has their rules of engagement. Let me give you a typical example. Um, please don't get me wrong when I talk of competition, not negative sense, but um, healthy competition. Maybe let me put it that way. Uh, being a pastor in Church of Pentecost has some rules of engagement. In every competition, also have rules. So. For instance, if you are um, an athlete, uh, you have to wait till you hear the shot before you start running. If you are in a competition and then nobody has, <laughs> there's no shot and then you start running, you will run and get to the, <laughs> to the line, finishing line, but you'll be disqualified. In football, I mean, you, you, for, if you are playing football at a point, if you foul somebody within the penalty box, even a planet. So every competition has their rule of engagement. So in everything you do, whether you are in the private sector, sometimes because we have our own businesses, we think that there are no rules of engagement for us as owners. You can just uh, take in the money from the company at any time. 
we can choose to invest at any time. If you have your own church, you may think that, hey, I can, I can organize programs and in, at, at any time is my church. No, 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 no. Whether you are the owner, whether you're working for somebody, whether you have your own business enterprise, there are rules of engagement. There are strict disciplines that we ought to follow. If not, you will not be able to contend with the challenges of your competition or the challenges of your time. And I was giving the example of a Pentecost, uh, as, as a, uh, if you're a Pentecost pastor, you, one of, it's, it's, it's interesting, but uh, just for illustration, you know, if you're a Pentecost pastor, you can't just eat anywhere. I recall there was a time I was so hungry, so hungry. Now, these, these are not um, doctrines or things that will take you to heaven or hell. No, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. But uh, I'm saying that every work, every profession has their own ethics. So I was so hungry, I wanted to eat. Uh, but a Pentecost pastor, you cannot just go and see some plantain, roasted plantain, and just buy and granite. And then you say you're hungry, so you stand by the street and start chewing. <laughs> you can't do that. But that wouldn't take it to you. You can't do that. So I was so hungry. I went and I, I saw some small, um, I don't know what I should call it, top bar or restaurant or whatever, but don't worry, it's a small place. So, so I went there to, to try and eat because I couldn't um, just eat anywhere. Now immediately I sat down, this is that came and said, oh, uh, Papa, praise the Lord. I said, oh my goodness, here too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, by nature, I couldn't just eat at that corner, but I was so hungry. So immediately said, praise the Lord. I said, hallelujah, I just got a conversation. And I, I had to move away. It is not a sin, it is not a crime to have eaten at that corner. But because of my position, I had to put myself under strict rules of engagement. And these little things that we do not observe in our business ethics, in our, in our conversations, in our relationships, tend to destroy the beauty of our work. So in competition, I've said that there's the need for you to observe the rules of engagement of that competition. So if, you have, if you're a business entity, you must have your own personal rules of engagement. Strict rule. Don't say that I am the boss, I am the CEO. And so I am above those rules and engagement. You will collapse. Remember, we are talking about being able to compete, coming under strict discipline. So take note of these points that we are making, coming under strict discipline. And what will help you to be disciplined is that those rules of engagement. The other point, apart from having rules of engagement, code of conduct, and all the things, there are different grades. There are those that are, must be strictly ahead to. So for instance, when you come to Christianity, there are doctrines that cannot be broken. And as for doctrines, it will never change from Jesus to, to Jesus. So from Jesus to Jesus, it will not change. Doctrines are, are sacred and they will not change. Then we have practices. And sometimes the problem with some pastors, church leaders, is that they equate practices and policies and strategies to doctrine. And so they, they put, if you are not even careful, you may put weight on the rules and regulations and policies and, and strategies are the same as doctrine. And so if somebody breaks a particular rule of engagement, if you're not careful, you use the same hammer for a doctrine on something that is a, just a rule or that is a practice. And it is so in business entities. If you do not know of all the rules and the code of conduct, which ones are there, the, the, those that are like the doctrine of the company, which, which, which of all the rules which are like doctrine for you? In your marriage, which are the issues that are like doctrines? In your business, which are like doctrines? You must be clearly stated and that must be clear that as for these things, we don't break it. We stick to it. Then you come to the code of conduct and the ethics of the job. Those ones too are critical for your competition. They are essential for the competition. But then when you begin to break it, the same level of uh, discipline should not be like the doctrines. If not, we end up destroying life, destroying people. You are a manager of a company. Somebody 
comes to work late, maybe one day, and then out of anger, because there are no strict rules of engagement, out of anger, out of because you are the boss, you just sack the person. And just keep the person at work, I'll pay you, I'll pay you off. Forgetting the person has a family, the person has children to cater for. So it is important that to beat the competition, to and, and enable those that you have to be committed to know that they have security in the organization. There should be clarity as to which things are doctrines, which things are policies, which things are code of conduct, which things are ethics. And once these things are clearly defined, then you know where to put what weight and where to put a lot of training and emphasis in. These are things that we need to understand. Then again, in competition, so we've talked about the rules, and I've said that no matter how well you do, no matter how well you play football, if you don't put the ball in the net, if you, if you kick somebody, no matter how good you are, if you don't go by the rules, you miss it. So we are people who are so intelligent, so brilliant, have awesome ideas, but they do not last because they do not go through the strict discipline that we are talking about. They do not follow the rules of engagement. Now, the next thing that we need to also understand is that we, we in competition, there are time lags, time, time lines. For instance, is the competition a kind of a relay? Is it a hundred meters? If it is athletics competition, is it hundred meters? Is it a relay? Is it um, uh, the long distance one, 800 by whatever, the ones that they run, or is it cross country? If you don't understand the nature of the competition, you may apply the wrong rules. You may apply the wrong rules. You may apply the wrong engagement. So you must understand the competition. For instance, if it is a relay race, your business is like a relay. That is the nature of it. It means that you must know the people that will begin with you. So you start a business, maybe you start um, uh, whatever business it is, you, what kind of business, what example can we give you? You are into the IT, you are into um, e-commerce, you have a transport company, whatever it is. Or if you come to church, you have begun a church, uh, is it a kind of a relay? Is that a calling? Is that what God has called you to do? Now, if it is like a relay, then it means that you would need to know who do you start with? Who do you begin with? It's not everybody that you want to start something with. The fact that a person is good, the fact that a person is brilliant, the fact that a person has achieved laurels elsewhere does not mean that they will help you. And sometimes we spend big monies and engage people because they've done it and they can. Maybe those people will be, have been needed at the finishing line or when there's a change in baton. So you need to understand who do we start with? What are the people? They sometimes may not be the best, but they, may, they must be team players. They must be people who understand, who want to go through thick and thin with you. And you may sometimes sacrifice these people because they are commoners, because they are not the best. But you needed them from the beginning. But because you, you have not understood that as a relay, you need people who are forceful to, to start the game with you. You go and you make mistakes. Horses, to contend, you must know how to begin. If it's a long distance journey, sometimes I, I recall that in long distance journey, some people will start running um, like 100 meters because they don't understand the type of competition. They run like 100 meters and uh, very soon their gas is off. And so they, they, they gas and they mess it up. And if you look at uh, the uh, one of the very interesting uh, relays that I have watched on social media, um, Hussein Boats, that I never forget to watch it. It's, it's, I keep, anytime I watch it, I enjoy it so much. You, you would realize that when they started at a point, yes, there was a change over here and there, change over here and there, but at a point, you needed when to change speed, when to change direction, when to intensify, when to slow down. And that is what we fail to realize in our competition. I've talked about you need to know who to start, who to start, if it's a real, who to start with. And then at what point do you change? At what point do you change? And change here has to do with changing speed, 
um, if it is long distance, when you change the, the speed, do you maintain some tempo at a point or do you increase the tempo? If it is a football match, when you retreat and defend, when you begin to attack, you must understand the dynamics of all these competition. And because we don't study nature, because we don't study the things around us, we only go to church and we begin to pray. Those of you who speak in tongues, you pray and blow all the tongues and you're just waiting for some heavenly angel to descend. I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord. <laughs> I recall uh, we went to one of the schools and uh, there was this prophecy from this high school girls. Um, those days, I don't want to mention the name of the school, but he said, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord. I'm coming down like a caterpillar, boom. You see, sometimes these are some of the prophecies you want to wait and hear. You want people to prophesy that I'm coming down like a caterpillar, boom. But I've said that you must be sensitive to hear, to read from nature. So the things God has created, competition, all those things you can read from it. So if you're a business person and you are watching uh, sports, really, your, your, if your mind has been reconditioned to understand these principles of containable horses that I'm sharing with you, that even in race, you would understand and apply it to your marriage, apply it to your business, apply it to your church. Hear God speak in this thing. So at a point, you have to know when to change over and who to take over during the change. Do you need another person that will keep the tempo or you need somebody that will has a faster pace? And so you need people at a point who run with the vision, run with the idea. You may begin and need people who are, who are creative minds, people who, who can bring out ideas and suggestions, but they may not be the same people who can run with the vision. They may not. And then sometimes because, they, they, well, it's good to be loyal. I'm not, a, I'm not talking about this loyalty here. I'm talking about knowing when to change, knowing when to change the strategy. So you may have people with creative minds, creative ideas, but you must know when to change, when to let there, there be a swap for the very people who are the creative minds to hand over. Maybe you have to redeploy your strategy, move them to various other departments to continue the creative work, and then engage other people who run with the vision, run with the idea, know when to change. I'm sure if Swiss watch at a time when the, these uh, electronic watches were being invented, uh, you read around and we are told that they were they were wanted to stick to the normal uh, chain um, watch that moves. But those who were quick to go with that electronic life, those who knew when to change, were the people who were succeeded. Um, if I'm not careful as a pastor, I'll keep talking and talking and talking, but I don't intend to let this to be a, a talk show. I want to hear your views. I want to hear your opinion. I want to hear your input in terms of, I've just uh, spoken today about competition. We'll continue, God willing, next week. I want us to have the next 30 minutes to engage. I've said that you must understand the competition. You must understand the rules. You must know when to change the button. You must know who to start, who to continue, who to end a particular agenda, who to, who, what is the start, what strategy do you have to put in place? I've also spoken about your ability to read, to read from the times, to read from the seasons, and you uh, know what to do. What is your experience? What have you learned in, in, a, in a particular field, in your marriage? Is, can you share an example where you needed to change a strategy, maybe in your communication with your wife? Uh, have you, uh, can you share an experience where at a particular point you were able to change a particular strategy and it helped? Something you were doing all over and it was creating problems, but at a point you changed. Those are the things I'm talking about. In your ministry, is there a time where you struggled, but there was, you were able to know that, look, let me change here. Maybe your experience will help somebody. Or how do you beat competition? What are your lessons? What strategies have you done? How do you stay competitive in this, in this world? Now there are churches all over. There are businesses all over. How do you stay comp um, competitive? Remember, we have said that contending with horses is contending with the best in the world. I don't believe that if you are in Africa, it means that you should compete yourself with, with, with lower people. No, 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 no. You must compete with the best in the world. And that is the idea of trans relationship. That is the idea of contending with horses, being among the best. I'm just going to give you some music for about 
a minute or two and I will start taking your questions. I will start taking your questions. So just a moment and we will be with you as you listen to the music. Just a minute and I will turn your back. So don't go away. Here you are. Good to see you. <laughs> oh, great, 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 great. And David. Um, just a minute. This conversation, okay? So just a last for me. Yeah, I just realized that my Laptop is going off, so I'm connecting the cables, so don't worry. Hallelujah. It's working in the night. All right, let me see if I can get some of the um, comments from Facebook questions. Um, how do we beat competition? How do we contend? with the challenges. What are some of the challenges that, um, can you hear me? Elder, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, yes, we can hear you. All right, good, okay, good. All right, so I believe that. All right, so uh, what are some of the competition that we need to be able to beat as Africans, as, as Nigerians, as Ghanaians? We, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. All right, let's hear from you. Okay. All right. If you have any question, I've talked about competition. I've talked about how we can um, contend with even horses, contend with the challenges of our time. I've talked about rules that has to be followed. Can you share with me your experience? I've talked about knowing when to change. And uh, God willing, I will be dealing more a bit on, on knowing when to change. How? We, as even churches, fail to realize when to change as church leaders, when to turn the new page. And we we'll miss out a lot. And I pray that people will understand the principle behind contending with us, knowing that we are in a competitive world and we really know when to change. So if you have any question about the things that we've spoken about, as for today, I said, I don't intend to go into details. I just want us to, um, I don't want to speak for long. I want to just excite us to start thinking, what are the rules of engagement? Do you think that sometimes we don't know the difference between things that must be seen as doctrines and treated as such, and things that must be seen as just ethics, like me not eating granite in the streets? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so that if you see me as a, as a, as a pastor chewing granite, and say, ah, but we said that pastors are not supposed to chew granite. So those are, those are not the real. And if, if you are unable to distinguish these things, you will not be able to um, be who God really wants us to be. Uh, last, I spoke about and I still want us to consider it. I spoke about how, as a church, we've missed out on timelines. And I know that businesses have also missed out on the timings. And I pray that next week we'll be looking at specifics. Um, next week, God will be looking at the specific things that I think that must be fully considered. So folks, let me hear you out. Um, Let's apply these things. Have you, has God spoken to you through nature? Have you gone through an experience that became a learning curve for you? Have you had an encounter that became a springboard for a new idea, for a new vision, for a new dream? Uh, thank God for COVID-19. Now, um, old men, young men, non, non, um, uh, Holy Ghost, only Holy Ghost men and all those people have seen the need to use technology. So thank God for that. This, and now I know God is speaking through technology and that's what I mean by some of these things. What are the rules of engagement? You don't want to talk, I want you to continue. It cannot be one way. We have so much to learn. And um, if you are not talking, if you have a question, those of you who have, um, if you have a question about facing challenges, what challenges have you faced in the church? What challenges have you faced in your business? Uh, I, I think the, the, the place is becoming hot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just a minute. <laughs> All right, just a minute. Oh, let me hear you out, folks. We are not in a church. We're having a conversation. So don't, don't worry if I'm... Um, let's hear you out. What are your experience? Or you just want me to continue talking, talking. As for me, I have a long list of notes. I can talk and talk and talk. But I'll make it like a church. It's not nice. I want, I want to have a conversation with you. What are some of the things that are going on which you think should have been changed? I've said that in a competition, you must know when to change, when to change strategy, when to turn things around, who you should be with and who should take over from you. Um, I, now I believe that we know that it's time to change. <laughs> it's time to change. And if you don't change, what is it at your workplace that you think that should have been changed, but they are not changing? We are still there doing the same old thing. I think that uh, somebody has, let me check some of the messages. Uh, very soon, maybe I'll get, I'll get producers so that they will take messages from me. But for now. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so suppose so when, when um, uh, you started, you were, um, oh, you know, when I joined, you were, you were saying something about when God, you know, speak to us. And there, there are several uh, ways and um, means that God, um, but I think we, you know, predominantly as, as Africans or maybe Ghanaians, or maybe if we, we want to maybe narrow it down to maybe Pentecostals, um, we wait too long. And, uh, you know, I take myself as an example. There are so many things that, you know, God maybe has laid on my heart, you know, yes. to do in Ghana. But we always say, have you prayed? Did you hear the Holy Spirit talk, you know, speak to you? You know, we, 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 we are so glued to, you know, talking and symbols and stuff like that. We always want to something to manifest first, and then somebody will fall down, and then we know that this is God really working. This is God's yeah. work. This is Holy Spirit talking to us right now. Um, I remember uh, we went for some, you know, presbytery meetings sometime, and we needed to do something in the local assembly. 
And um, we were we were deliberating, and then we said, let's go ahead and do this. And then one elder, you know, got up and they said, but have you asked the Holy Spirit? I'm like, where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Spirit lives in us. Yeah. He moves with us. He talks with us. Wherever we go, he's with us. It is him doing his own will and his pleasure in us. So when we speak, it is he. He's the one that is. <laughs> and then he said, but have we, did we ask the Holy Spirit? So the decision-making process for um, some of us as Pentecostals, you know, it, it's a little bit, you know, challenge and delay because we we keep waiting, waiting and waiting. Did you ask the Holy Spirit? Have you heard from him? So much that even God, when God has spoken, we still want to see something. We want to fall on the ground. And then yeah. when you know, we get slain, maybe in the spirit, then we know that, aha, now God has moved. Now, now God you know, have changed. <laughs> so it, it is something that we are contending with. And yeah. at this time like 2020 uh post covid 19 if you're going to do that you will be out you know um the, the people that we are contending with they will cut us out completely you know um when you mentioned when you talk about you know the church if there were seven things that we could have changed there are still so many things that you know we we, we, we should maybe stop doing so are you bold? Would... Are you bold enough to tell me some of the things you think can be changed? <laughs> <laughs> it's a the conversation. Is, I mean, you know, for instance, Apostle, you know, for, for, for instance, at the time of yeah. worship. It is time only oh, when 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 we having you know a worship time, you know, worship time. Yes. It's only COP that I see that I see this on our stage on big platforms everywhere. We will come and tap people's shoulder and tell them to stop. You know when it's time. You know when they, they need to end the worship. Why do we have to do that? What, what do you want them to do? You... No, people should know. We should be able to train people. Say so that excellence. We don't come excellent. and tap, tap on excellent. people's shoulder and then tap on them and say, "Hey, it's time for My you friend, to stop the worship." Stop. You know, praises. People are singing. We have to come and tap them and say, "Stop singing." No, on any international platform, nobody does that. And these are little, little people look at us and say, uh, why you come and tap somebody, speak to their ear, stop it, you know, can we end the worship? No, um, it, it is not that. You mentioned something that I think it, it is very, very critical about protocols. And you said you, you went out to eat somewhere and said, somebody, somebody, <laughs> and then somebody came in and said, hey, pastor, you are here. I think, you know, there are protocols to um, everything in this world. Yes. Um, there are yeah. Protocols to swimming. Uh, there are protocols for people to enter into any kind of business market. Um, there are protocols in ministry. Um, there are ethics. There are, there are things that you need to observe. And that any assumption that anybody wants to do anything under their own term, quite yes. frankly, because you are an adult, you can do it. Um, it's either you're going to get disgraced or you know, you're going to die on your own terms. For instance, if you want to swim and you just jump in into the pool without uh -huh. learning how to swim, Quite frankly, because you're an adult, you're going to have your way, but you're going to die your way. Um, yeah. We yeah. need to learn some of these things um, out there. There's something that you, you, you mentioned about, you know, um, beating the competition and thinking about global. Uh, I see that in the next decade, you know, um, the next decade, you know, uh, post COVID-19, yeah. there's this idea that um, from everywhere that I've, I've, been, I've, I've, been, I've been looking, um, I watch World Economic Forum, I watch all these things. There's this idea called, you know, borderlessness. Um, so borderlessness, borderlessness, okay. Yes. Borderlessness is an, is, is an, is, is a, is a concept that individuals and entities, um, the way they can stay at one place and attract purchasing power, 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 power from everywhere. So okay. a company can be in Ghana, they can be in America, but they will attract purchasing power. They will still be relevant in every economy. So when okay. you take a look at Google, Google, <laughs> they do not even have an office in Accra, but people are using Gmail. People are using product by Google. You look at um, Netflix, people are streaming, you know, watching movies and other things, but they don't even have office in Accra or Lagos or anywhere or Pretoria, Johannesburg, but they are attracting purchasing power from everywhere. It is the same with a church, you know, um, we can, we, can, we can stay at an Accra, but we can be relevant. People all over the world can stay glued and tune in to PIWC Accra, our service. Why? 
because we 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 have cut that niche for ourselves and we are attracting audience from all corners of the world because of the value that you know we put forward we come we bring to the table we, we attract everybody um so it is, it is critical in our times there are so many things that you know for instance i'm going to use trotro app uh, when we started um oh. the entry strategy um it's very very you know critical um when when you're coming into any kind of environment or maybe terrain um it is very very important that you know um the entry uh, point in this environment there are things that might work here in america that maybe in ghana you know maybe cultural and ethnicity type of thing uh, it will not necessarily work for you very well so you need to learn those protocols before you jump into any market even though the idea might be very very very, very good and you said something about you know if if you need to hire people or bring uh, the, the kind of right people in you talk about the relay some people can start some people can be at the midpoint some people can be at the very end point and i'll use you know facebook as an example mark zuckerberg the founder of facebook he's not a business guy he's a technical guy he's an engineer until he brought in there are two people i've forgotten their name he brought them in mark was not even thinking about monetization how to make money with facebook but when these guys came in they they were the people that actually came in and transformed facebook into a business start to bring in money and so you know it's very important like what you said the really who to start who you put in here who put with the team members you know how you position them it, it is critical I think my line, my line went off, my, my volume went off. So I was saying that even in church, the fact that somebody is an overseer, general overseer, the person is um, the main man, does not mean that you should be at the front line in everything. Sometimes you must know those that you are going to change with. And it is said that you may want to hand over when the applause is loudest. Because the fact that you are the founder of the church does not mean that you must always be at the forefront. You may, at a point, <coughs> sorry, need to get someone who will take the church to a higher gear, but ah, that will never in most cases, it will be happening. So churches begin, and it, it does not last beyond the founder. Sometimes when the founder is dead, the church collapses. Sometimes even while the founder is alive, the church collapses. And it is because people do not understand, like even Jesus Christ, <coughs> sorry, even Jesus Christ, um, knew when to hand over. He never, he never um, stayed on this earth forever. He knew when to hand over. He knew when to change the baton. So the fact that you are a founder of a church does not mean that be the leader of the church until you die. And that is a problem with some African leaders. And the reason why nations are not growing and nations, some nations are in stagnation is that leadership do not, they, they, they play God. They play God. But if God wanted the world to be like that, cells will not die and, and be recreated. And that is why even in living cells, in your blood cells, blood cells are dying every day. New ones are being created because change is important. Change is inevitable. And so I know this is a very hard saying that ha, I formed my church. When should I ever hand over when I'm not dead? You'll sit there and you realize that your church will die with time. I'm not saying that there is always um, physical handover. Sometimes I'm talking about change in the, in the context of changing even the strategy. If, if you were always um, in, child, in church using banjo, you must know when to change the strategy of your church. Don't say that, ah, this is, this is how um, our forefathers conducted the church. Uh, God is unchanging. God is um, 
not changing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this thing will not change. That is why I said you must know what is doctrine. What carries the weight of a doctrine? And what is ethics like a pastor not chewing uh, granite in town? There are certain things that must change. If, if, if I travel to some place and I'm so hungry and I'm dying, and I need to, I need to, I, I'm dying of hunger, and I need to chew some granite to survive, you think I, I, I would say I wouldn't chew? Because that is the uh, ethics of the profession. So let's, let's get this very clear. Let's get the understanding very clear and know when God wants a change. Can I get any other? Let me see if I can get a questions from um, our friends. You can inbox me if you have any question you want us to address or an experience you've had uh, where there should have been a change of baton, but the change didn't take place and how it affected the business. Can you share an experience in your marriage with your relationship, maybe your fiance? There are certain things that you needed to change at a point you didn't change and how it cost you. Or when at a point you effected some change and it speed up uh, the, the, uh, the dream, the vision, a change that caused a total transformation. And I use the example of Usain Bolt. Uh, when Usain Bolt took the baton, at, the, at a point he and the American guy, all of them were almost at par, but he knew when to change the speed. So sometimes there are certain things that you have to go slowly. There are times too you need to change the speed, contending with horses. Um, horses are very interesting creatures. Sometimes uh, when they beat it, it knows that I have to speed up. Uh, when they use their leg to kick it, I, I'm not a horse trainer, so I don't know. But the horse even understands that this is the time to speed up, this is the time to slow down, this is the time to rise up. Human beings sometimes fail to know that even in my own life, this is the time to speed up. Even in my own life, this is the time to change. In my own life, this is the time to do this, this is the time to do that. So um, we need to really, really understand some of these things and it will help us greatly. All right, I've seen, um, let me just quickly pick this comment. Uh, let me get the... Let me get your input, okay? Descent <laughs> uh, is asked a very interest. He himself says that it's controversial. I'll try and read it and see if I can have an answer. And I read, and uh, this is from um, Nguaku Ramafakela from South Africa, popularly called Descent. <laughs> and this is his message. Please, let me be controversial. Uh, please, Descent, don't be too controversial, I beg you. <laughs> A bit. Is it possible that the Church of Pentecost Executive would have mixed race, okay, say racial, and also pastors who are women? Is it possible? Um, as far as the Church of Pentecost is concerned, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Executive Council, neither am I speaking on behalf of the Church of Pentecost, but I'm just sharing what I believe is my understanding. The Church of Pentecost is a global church. For now, you see that quite a number of the executives are possibly Ghanaians and a few foreigners here, and there's all because it started from Ghana. I believe a time will come where the church will become so global that we're going to have Indians, we're going to have uh, Japanese, we're going to have, uh, it's possible to even have a chairman who is from uh, Burkina Faso, a chairman who is from Nigeria, a chairman who is from India. Nothing is impossible because the church is a growing church. When the church started, we had no foreigners on the executive, but now we have non ghanaians on the executive. Uh, we didn't have apostles who were um, uh, uh, we didn't have pastors who were apostles. They were all Ghanaian, Ghanaian, Ghanaian. And now we have uh, South African apostles. We have uh, Mozambican apostles. We have Brazil. I mean, we have apostles in other nations. And once 
per the constitution of the church, any apostle and prophet can become a leader. So you can have a situation where an apostle in um, any country with time will become a leader. As for the issue about women pastors, <laughs> Uh, that shall not lead me into temptation. <laughs> uh, for now, the Church of Pentecost believes that we follow the, the teachings and practices of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we only do the things we saw Jesus do or Jesus teach. Secondly, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So our belief is that we do the things we either saw the apostles and Jesus teach, or we saw the apostles and Jesus practice. And that is the foundation of whatever we do in the church of Pentecost. For now, we did not see Jesus teach or, or, or practice the ordination of women as pastors. Neither did we see the apostles teach or practice the ordination of um, women as pastors. If a time comes, and we have a better understanding, a better revelation into the things that Jesus taught and practiced. And in that teaching and practice, we come to see somewhere in the Bible that, oh yeah, Jesus taught and practiced ordination of women. Jesus taught and the apostles taught and practiced the ordination of women. I don't think the church was still stand by that. No, 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 no. I believe that until we have got to that point for now, because we believe that a church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so every teaching and every practice must have been what Jesus taught or practiced or what the apostles taught or practiced. We don't build doctrines on just one of thing. If it was not a practice, if it was just an action, for instance, Jesus uh, took um, clay or mud on the ground, spat on the ground, mixed clay, and put in the eye of a blind man. Jesus did that, but we don't go about doing it because it was not a practice. It was not a practice. So before we build any doctrine, we ask ourselves, what did Jesus often do? Jesus often prayed, Jesus often taught, Jesus often evangelized, so that was his practice. That is what also the apostles did. When we look at ordination, Jesus ordained men. When it comes to the apostles, he talked about the men. So. Uh, for now, that is why Church of Pentecost do not ordain women. Other churches ordain women. Maybe they have seen in the Bible, per the revelation they have had uh, by their own practice, uh, they ordain. But this is the stand of Church of Pentecost for now. So, uh, uh, Nguaku, in response to your two questions, can the Church of Pentecost ever have a mixed race on the executive? That, uh, per the constitution of the church, it doesn't bar foreigners. It says the chairman or the executive shall be apostles and prophets. So anybody who is an apostle or prophet, I believe if it is the will of God, eventually can become the chairman. Pastor's ordination uh, for now, that is the revelation we have. So this end, that is a simple answer I would want to give. And, and the Church of Pentecost stands by that. As I said, I, I'm speaking as a minister, not on behalf of the executive council or the general council, but that is that is the understanding I have. Any, uh, let me see if I have any other question. Um, any other thing you think can be changed, must be changed, just drop me a message, a WhatsApp, or um, on the platform, and let's have, let's have a conversation. We are talking about contending, competing with horses and we are saying that if you recall some of you didn't we were not with us so it makes the conversation a bit difficult but please try and follow me every day so that we build on it we've already said that the standards in contending with the horses are beyond normal human standards and so we said that uh, when we talk of contending with horses we are talking about being among the best globally being among the best wherever you are we are talking about levels that are just beyond natural. Everybody, mediocrity, everybody is doing this. Every human being is doing this. But something that is beyond normal human strength, normal human philosophy, something that is extraordinary. How can we contend with horses within that line? And that is what we are looking at. So um, with that understanding, just making an input 
let's hear you out. What are your real experience? Is there something you think ought to change in your workplace? In Africa, look at African leadership. Why is it so difficult for African leaders to say, I have served a term, so I should step down. We have explained that if you do not understand that in contending with horses, there are times you need to change, whether you are a founder or the leader or whatever. You either change as a person or you change strategy. If you don't understand these things, you will not go on. You may want to share what you think is the reason why African leaders, okay, not African leaders, some. <laughs> some African leaders, church, some church founders never want to change and all those things, never want to change, never want to hand over. They just want to be the one in charge. They just want to be the one, okay? Okay, there's another question from um, Ramafalek, Ramafalkela. Oh, decent, your name now is becoming, and this is his question, he says, what makes you always relevant to the issues affecting young people? Please, apart from God's grace and guidance, uh, what makes you always, listen, I'm not sure I get your question. Are you talking about what makes me as a person or what makes someone relevant? Uh, if you can come back, if you can resend it, I think it's gonna be helpful. Uh, Mulenga, <laughs> uh, I'm also, um, Mulenga is asking, what is the main purpose of opening tree assemblies in countries like South Africa? Hey, folks, <laughs> this is not a Church of Pentecost meeting anyway, but once you ask, I'll, I'll attempt to understand. Um, the, the, the reason why we open tree, or for that matter, any language group, in any nation, not only South Africa, in India, in America, uh, Bible talks about you must start from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into the outer part of the world. So every people group are necessary for the gospel. But in Church of Pentecost, the, the, the strategy is that wherever you go, uh, you realize that in Paul's strategy, where, wherever he went, sometimes you go to the Sahindri, sometimes you go to his own people. So you start from a point. So if you're a missionary um, and you go and you can connect with some people you already know together, that makes it easier. But it does not mean that it must always be the case. So the three people in South Africa or the three in England or wherever, is necessary because um, they are the, the people you want to reach out to. They are also souls, but it does not end there. So I'm, I'm foreseeing a time where we have tree services, uh, we would have Yoruba services, we would have, um, the, I don't know the languages, uh, Lusaka, uh, uh, maybe Mulenga tell me some of the um, languages in, in, in Zambia. So you, we, we would wish that when we go to a place where we have lots of Zambians there and they have a particular language that would be useful, we will use it. So it's not only about tree but it's about being able to reach out to people who would understand. So you have the tree, you have the international services, um, and as I said, we'll continue having different languages. So tree, yes, because they are also souls. Tree, yes, because a lot of the missionaries who went out came from Ghana, um, and then they have a lot of Ghanaians there, so they are also souls, they need to reach out to them, but it doesn't end there. I'm sure that with time, when we have different people group in different nations, Yoruba, as I said, Igbo, uh, Lusaka, what are your languages? Give me some of them. I uh, would, by all means, have um, outreaches to them. If you come to Ghana, for instance, we have services in different languages. Uh, so that is the common one that they normally use. But you can be sure that Church of Pentecost is not only tree center. Uh, the focus is only a, st a stepping stone. The focus is to reach out to every indigenous people to make nations as much indigenous as possible and as international as possible. That is the change we are all pushing and driving at, okay? Any other question? Um, 
um, decent, you can come back. I'm not sure I really got that, the youth question. Are you talking about me or you're talking about young people in general? Let's, let's get that clear and then I can respond to it. Oh, me as a person. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You're asking why I'm always relevant. Wow, this, this question is too direct. <laughs> can you be asking that why am I always relevant? Um, so you're asking that why am I as a person relevant to young people? Well, um, I don't want to answer the relevance, but in terms of maybe I'm often engaging young people because I believe that um, one, I believe that is a calling. Secondly, I believe that I'm young in, in spirit and every time I'll be young. I also most importantly believe that they are the energy of every society. They are the strength of every community, church, nations, um, every organization. Bible says that the old men shall dream dreams and the young men shall see vision. So you, you cannot lose sight of the strength and the energy of young people. So yes, we, we focus on adults, we focus on all class of people, but I think that I realize that if we can succeed in every nation, in business, in, in, in um, nation building, in longevity, you want uh, people that can catch the vision and run for so many years. So if you're able to get the young people, then you can guarantee that you can run with them for so many years. So if you're asking me why I'm relevant, because I see the value, the next thing is that I study, I try to study about young people. I, I engage young people a lot, wherever I am. I try to get um, young people. When you work with young people, uh, you, you look younger <laughs> and it's their, their, their attitude also affects you a bit. But you must be able to know when to be young, but to still act maturely in the midst of young people. And that is the uh, tension that you have to correctly address, knowing that you must always be able to know that, okay, these are young people, I'm relating with them as young people, but at the same time, I must exhibit some level of maturity. So I, I value young people, I study about them, I relate with them, and, and so, because I study and I relate with them, they share ideas with me, they tell me some of the things. You know, young people easily share their minds confidently, so they share, and you learn a lot from them. So as I learn from them, I'm able to relate with them. And I believe there are people who are also doing well in those areas. So this end, if you're asking me personally, these are one of few of the answers I can give you. Um, if you have any other question engagement, we'll be ending very soon. We just have some few minutes uh, still on beating the competition, still on being relevant, still on knowing when there has to be changed, still on knowing when to turn the baton, still on knowing when to bring effect changes, when to change the speed, when to slow down, still on knowing when to change the team or when to bring a particular team on board, still on contending with horses. Just a few minutes and then we'll be off. If you have any question, let's know. If you have anything that you want us to engage with, um, let's know. Any other thing you want us to talk about? Just a few minutes and I will be gone. Let's hear you out if you have any question. Okay. All right, let me see. Let me get this other question and then I try to attend to them. Now about five, 10 minutes, we shall be off. So if you have any question, just quickly, let's have it now and let's deal with it. <laughs> All right, I just saw this, right? Okay, it says, Apostle, please, I beg to differ. Can't a woman hold an office of the fivefold ministry? The Holy Spirit came on all who are in the upper room. Okay. Um, I, as I said, this is from Mabel. Apostle, please, I beg to differ. Can't a woman hold an office of the fivefold ministry? The Holy Spirit came upon all 
who were in the upper room. Yes, the Holy Spirit came upon all who are in the upper room. Here, we are not talking about being used by God. We are talking about ordination. We are not talking about being used by God. And in Church of Pentecost, women are used. Um, they are used to minister healing. They are used to minister, be evangelistic, prophetic, to um, prophesy. You know, there are elders who have not been ordained elders, or uh, sorry, who have not been ordained apostles. But you can see that they carry apostolic grace. They've operate, they've not been ordained. So there are women who operate by the Holy Ghost. I'm saying that when it comes to ordination, the Holy Spirit came. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit was going to come on all people, but he chose men. Joel said that in the last days, I'll pour my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Jesus knew this. Jesus knew the scripture. Jesus taught the scripture. Yet when he was ordaining, he ordained men. And so I'm saying that we are not against people who do it, but I'm only telling you that Church of Pentecost, this is why we don't do it for now. That's why we don't do it. And that is our stand. And I, I am a firm believer of the stand of the Church of Pentecost anyway. And I'm saying that if in future God gives us a new revelation, a new understanding, okay, Jesus taught and practiced. The apostles taught and practiced. For now, I have not seen it. We have not seen it. We've not seen where Jesus taught and practiced women ordination. The apostles taught and practiced women ordination. But Jesus used women, and we also use women. Uh, women evangelize. The Samaritan woman evangelized. The, I mean, the, not the Samaritan, okay, the woman from Samaria. Evangelized. Um, we know of Phoebe. Uh, we know of Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, these are people who taught. So yes, women can evangelize. They can preach. They can heal. They can prophesy. I'm only saying when it comes to ordination, when it comes to like Jesus uh, took the 12 apostles like the Pauls, like the Timothys, um, the bishop should be a husband of one wife. He didn't say a wife of what you see. So these are some of the things that we stand on. Um, it's, 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 it's things that people have different opinion and, and I respect that. But this is why we do what we do until the executive and the general council, we have a new revelation. Uh, for now, this has stand and we've stand by it. I am a firm believer in that. I believe that women must be used, and, and I use women a lot, but I've not seen ordination yet, okay? Um, if you ask me a question and I don't have the answer, I will pray after it, uh, ask you to, to hold on and I will ask from the executive council. But I, as I said, let's not make this too much Church of Pentecost. It's the body of Christ. I'm looking at it from the business perspective. I'm looking at it from school. I'm looking at it from research. I'm looking at it from uh, science, uh, business, different aspect of life, relationship. So when we talk of contending with horses, I'm talking about how we can stand the challenges in marriage, challenge, challenges in business, challenges in competition. And, and that is how I want us to look at it. Even though no question is forbidden, uh, if I have the answer, I will give you the answer. If I don't have the answer, I refer to elder, elder, uh, what thing is there? Maybe his father is a pastor, so his father have gave him an answer before he came. <laughs> All right. Any other question? We have just about five minutes, ten minutes. My sister, you will be off. So if you have any question, please let's have it. Thank you for the engagement. Thank you for your questions. Um, if anybody has any question, please, or a suggestion or a comment. We would want to hear from you. Uh, I would have wished that you also join me on Zoom so that I can hear you out. Uh, let me see if there's a comment I've missed. All right, so far I think I've tried. All right, so if you just join, let me try to give a summary of what we've shared today. We've said that God created everything by his spirit. And so the, everything has connection with God. We said that, Bible says that every creation is in Christ. 
So whether they are trees or plants or everything, whatever, it is in Christ Jesus. And we have made it very clear that the Lord did all these things by spirit and by life. And so God knows how to communicate with his creation. God is sovereign. God is all powerful. But the idea is not for you to worship God because his spirit created all these things and he, he connects with them. No. Just like human beings, his spirit is in us. He connects with us. But it doesn't mean we worship human beings. But at a point, we are trying to establish that all this creation speaks about God, speaks about the glory of God, speaks about the intent and the purposes of God, and that God can speak through his creation. And so we should be very alert and not only wait till we come to church before we, that says the Lord, we hear. And that if you will be alert as you drive, your, your spiritual antenna will catch it. Business ideas, relationship issues, uh, how to turn things around. The bears can speak to you. The mountains can communicate. And I'm not talking about new age here. I'm saying that God can speak through these things to you. God is sovereign. I'm not talking about uh, going to sit by a river and say, river, speak, speak, speak. No. I'm not saying go and sit by a mountain and say, mountain is God. So I can hear God. No. I'm saying that once you are conscious that God is sovereign, once you are conscious that God created all these things by his spirit and there's connection with them, I'm only trying to say that God can communicate. God can give you ideas. God can give you strategies from the things he has created. And we we'll use the horse as an example. And we have said that the horse hears very well. And so what will make you compete is your capacity to hear. We spend a lot of time, so we didn't spend a lot of time today. We also say that uh, you must also have the capacity to, to smell, to descend. And that we also dealt with. So today we didn't talk about that. But then today we only said that the horse is for competition. And we said that to be able to compete, you must have a clear understanding of the rules of engagement. You cannot have the fact that everybody is doing a restaurant does not mean you must also do a restaurant. And even if you are doing a restaurant, there has to be a different rules of engagement depending on the kind of competition you are dealing with. And we said that in those competitions, you must know what type of competition. Is it a relay? Is it a hundred meters? Is it a long um, distance run? Is it a football competition? Is it table tennis? Know what is the engagement you are involved in. And if it is, for instance, a relay, is it, is it um, are you able to uh, know when to change the baton, change the idea, change the strategy? If you do not change the baton at the right time, others will over, over, over go ahead of you and they'll beat you with the competition. And so you must be sensitive. And that is why your ears must be open. Your spiritual antenna must be open. Your, your, your ability to watch and to be alert and to be critical is important. Yesterday, when I was with the PRWC, I said that God said we should watch and pray. So the watching is important. Watching means you are awake, you are alert. Your, your, your creative antenna, your spiritual antenna, your uh, academic antenna, research antenna, business antenna is so alert, so sharp, so that as you walk around, business ideas will drop. As you even go on Facebook, as you, as you interact with people. But if you are not conscious of God's creativity, God's ability to use all these things to speak to you, I'll say that you become narrow-minded and you only want to hear God in, through preaching. You'd only want to hear God when you go to church. But all these things, when God speaks through you and you come before God and say, God, this idea has dropped in my mind. What do you think about it? And you engage God, you will realize that it becomes an amazing experience. It becomes an amazing experience. So, uh, let God give us the grace to be able to contend, to be able to beat competition. And I pray over your life this evening that it's not only about church, but in your marriage. If, if your marriage is not beating the challenges of marriage, the problems that comes with marriage, if, if your marriage is tearing down, if your relationship is tearing apart, may you have the grace to contend with those challenges. If your business is folding up, if your business is breaking down, may you have the capacity to contend with them and overcome. If your um, church is folding up, I'm saying that may you have the grace to be able to contend with the challenges of the work, of the ministry. 
with challenges of business, in your relationship with your children, if you are losing it, do you have the capacity to move to content? I pray that this series that we are dealing with, contending with horses, which is only an aspect of what I refer to as trans leadership, and the writer will talk about that, but contending with horses, which is raising an army of people who are so conscious of the times, who are able to resist every challenge. As we go through this series, may the Lord help us so that at the end of the day, you will not fail in the uh, race. Competition will not beat you, but you will beat competition. Challenges will not swallow you, but you will swallow challenges. That you will be part of the team or the army God is raising who are unbeatable and und you cannot destroy them. Visions, dreams cannot be quenched. May you be among those who are the group of the legacy leaders, people who live living legacies, that the ideas you sell, the businesses you start, the relationships you build, even when you are dead and gone, your impact will not die because you would have established an eternal legacy, you would have established a system that will last over time. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord help you. And I hope that next week again, um, Saturday at 5 p.m., you will join me to look at contending with horses. We'll be dealing with it for some time. It's a whole series. Uh, we'll be dealing with you. And come up with ideas, come up with plans. Let's have a conversation. Elder um, Boateng, God bless you so much uh, for having a conversation. The others didn't want to talk. They're on Zoom, but they are not talking. So uh, we would, we will leave it like that. I'm hoping that next time the conversation would increase and we would go on. Until I meet you or until I come your way again uh, next week. Uh, I hope I've not missed anybody's question or comment. Let me quickly go through the questions again. If somebody spends time to write and you are not able to read, it's not, it's not, it's not nice. So let's see. And then we'll quickly call it a day. All right. Okay, so folks, thank you for having time with me. I'm going to catch you next week, same time. 5 p.m. Ghana time live. We're going to do with different topics. And very soon we'll be engaging people, we'll be having people join us on Zoom to respond to some of your questions. Some of the questions, if I cannot answer, I'll throw it to them. They'll be with us. So let's meet on Saturday, 5 p.m. God richly bless you. You can just enjoy the music as I sign off. God is working. God is working. That is the music. God bless you. Bye bye. Bye bye. God bless. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.